Welcome everyone, this is Fred Gleek. I'm here with Dr. Carl Blanks, who's graciously agreed to be my guest for this uh, program, helping you to increase conversion rates. He is, in fact, the CEO of conversion-rate-experts.com. Carl, thank you very much for being my guest. It's a pleasure, Fred. And I know that you've got a presentation prepared. Please go ahead and get started, and I will interrupt when my small mind can't understand something you're saying. Okay, and I'll 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 try to uh, I'll try to be as interesting as possible. <laughs> um, yeah, conversion rate optimization. Um, uh, what I'm going to talk about in the next um, the next few minutes is, but firstly, proven strategies for increasing sales. Um, I'm going to be talking about some things that, uh, let's think, it, it, so many marketers are just, just this number one. So so many marketers know about all the basics about copywriting about about persuasion techniques and about um you know analytics tools and 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 so many things that are common so what i'm going to talk about is i think probably fairly advanced really and it's some some, some more advanced techniques for people who are, who are already um fairly sophisticated with with online marketing um, the second part, I'm going to give a template for ensuring that your writing is effective, uh, so so that anyone who just, you know, in the absence of, um, you know, that, facing that blank page, uh, that blank page, wondering what to actually put on a on a page, then a template that's really reliable and that that you know, more often than not will will produce a great converting page. And finally, how to get someone else to do it for you, because I know um, a lot of people are. You know, not necessarily the person who's going to be doing this. More responsive, more interested in in somehow recruiting a team or a person who can take responsibility for conversion. Sounds good. Uh, just a just a little bit of background. Um, uh, th that's a picture of me and uh, and my co-founder co Ben Jessen, and we our company began when we wrote an article about some of the the technique that we developed with with split testing and multivariate testing because we we were among the first to be using split testing on the web and and we wrote an article that prompted Google to it, it went viral and it prompted Google to get in touch with us and Google invited us to be among the first partners for Google's split testing tool uh, which at the time was called Google Website Optimizer so so our consultancy began you know, you know, largely, largely because Google were encouraged us to to form a consultancy because they they were very keen for for more companies to be carrying out um, conversion rate optimization with split testing. Uh, our our clients now include some some quite big names, Apple and Google and Sony, um, and uh, also some some companies that are are smaller but quite quite sophisticated in the web marketing world, like SEO Moz an SEO book who themselves are really sophisticated marketers and we we work directly with clients and we also work with agencies where where an agency will bring us in and we work on its clients landing pages and obviously the agency benefits because if its clients landing pages convert like crazy then the agency is able to increase its its ad spend profitably right um rather than go into detail now any you know if if you're interested in in finding about the kind of results we've been getting, that kind of, that little section on our on our homepage, just there's a video there, and it just shows some of the results. But in you know, in summary, we've been involved in so many different techniques and different, so many different aspects, like pretty much every aspect of web marketing. And conversion, even now, is just such a huge opportunity for growing your business because so much depends on conversion. So we've got we've got a huge number of of clients businesses where we've just you know, absolutely transformed the business um, this page here is is a page we've, we've annotated it actually it's available from our website but it's an example of a page that we used um, this time with SEO Moz and uh, they sell and I don't, don't have to even explain who SEO Moz are I think pretty much everyone in the web marketing world knows them very well, but we worked on their site and we hugely grew their business by um, by increasing the conversion rate of and, and in particular we worked a lot on this page and here they've, they've graciously allowed us to um, to actually describe 
exactly what worked on this page and why all the different page elements were in there. Um, and as you see, it all comes down to copywriting. Um, here's another example of an alarm company called Simply Safe, which we've currently we've grown somewhere between well, it was five times, but I think it's getting it's closer to ten times larger than when we started working with them. And if you can see, you know, so much of what we've done is is copywriting, but it's it's writing the right things on the on the page. And it's incredible that you can grow a business that much with words. Carl, quick um, quick interruption. Yes, Fred. Given the given the prevalence of video and and video sales pages and video on a sales page. Has this yeah. has this affected how you've done things? Because I would I would expect that many people now are thinking that video is the proper way to go, as opposed to words on a page. True or not true? Uh, uh, it's video is fantastic, and it and we found it to be very effective. And we 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 don't replace. We both is the answer. I'd say there are times when someone. Some some people prefer to when you do usability tests on a page. Some users prefer to read and skim read and find the information they want and don't want to sit through a video. Uh, and some people much prefer watching video. So so what we found is that having both is is really effective. Actually, it's funny. It's almost like it's scripted here because this um, this page I'm showing now, the crazy egg one. Um, we actually wrote an article which describes how on this page we. Um, we, the one I'm showing you is, is old text, but soon after we created this one, we added a video that summarized the whole message of this page, and we got another, uh, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but a, quite a big lift just from adding a video that effectively summarized what the page said. So got yes, the, both is the answer. Got it. So you have to address, on any, on any landing page now, the goal would be to have copy as well as video. Yes, I would say so. And again, you know, it, it, yeah, yeah generalizing is always, is always um, there's always a risk. But I'd say yes, video, in particular, what the, the, if I had to choose, the order I would do it in is get the copyright, because video is more difficult to edit. It's, you know, you can't just, you can't chop a, a sentence out of a video at the same speed that you can with, a, or tweak a sentence in a video like you could with copy. So get either get the copy right or get the copy working well, and then create a video and try to keep the video as um, as flexible as possible. So when you do need to change the first sentence of the video or or change things around, you know, it's there is an advantage for a video to be is agile the right word? Mm, yeah, you know, for for it to be easily editable, modular, in style. modularized, Modular, exactly. Yes, yes. Good, that makes sense. Yeah, with um, yeah, when you when, when people start to learn about writing copy, and obviously writing copy is one of the most valuable skills that anyone anyone could have. It's there are so many books out there. You think, well, what are the you know what words should I be putting on my page? And there's this book here that we bought, Words That Sell, and this book, it, it's a good book actually. It's a thesaurus of of good words for for um, persuasive copy. But that's not really where, what, it's not where the real problem lies. The problem is, what you really need is, is this follow-up book, more words that sell. No, not really. <laughs> um, and again, <laughs> it, no, of course, uh, yeah. as, as you know, Fred, what we really need is a book, phrases that sell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine, can you imagine what, what our bookshelf looks like? It's, um, and again, you know, the, this book has some useful phrases, and it's good to build up your vocabulary. But that's, again, it's it, it's really not where the answer is. Um, I don't know if you can remember, but a few years ago there was actually some software called Glyphius, which aimed to predict how successful a headline would be based on just on the actual words that were in it. So the word guarantee always increased the score of the headline, and it was based on loads of control ads. And again, even Glyphius you know, had its uses, and it was it was it was a good useful tool for reminding you about the important how each word in a headline is so precious but but again I, that's not I would no, be no, carry on. I would be remiss by not uh, by not saying that my most 
successful client is Bob Bly, who wrote the Copywriter's Handbook. If you pick it yes. up, the most recent edition is dedicated to me. Thank you, Bob, very much. Fantastic. Yes, yes. So no, he's good, Bob. He knows he knows his stuff. Yeah, good. Go ahead. Let's see. It, yeah, the, the the first the first step that we find is, and it's it's a step that most people there, there are two steps to copywriting. There are, the first one is being able to sell the product face to face. It's not really about you know this part of the. It, it's not about words, and it's not about killer copywriting words. It's about actually being able to get yourself into a position where you understand the the product and the value proposition enough so that you could sell it to a real person because because the your website is a robot salesperson and your robot salesperson will be no better than its creator mm. um if you can't sell something face to face then what then you don't have a chance of creating a page that would be able to sell it because the page will not be as persuasive so the first thing that we do, and this is this is really useful, is we speak whenever we're working on a page for something. We seek out someone who can sell face, to, who has actually sold the product face to face. So here we were working on, uh, um, we we're working on. I won't I won't give the details, but it was like a, a tech, technology device, and uh, and we went to a store where they were being sold, and we spoke with this girl who was really good and knowledgeable and enthusiastic about the product and we we asked her all about how she sells it face to face and and we also asked her what we showed her the website and said you know what do you think of the website how could we improve this website and she said she said oh i know that site so well she said we uh, we went on there looking for answers when customers used to ask us questions, but the answers aren't even on there, so we had to find <laughs> them from other means. And she said, and she actually she listed, I think it was 22 things that customers ask, and things that she says to almost every customer because they ask that that are you are essential in making the sale, but which weren't on our client's site. Yikes! And so so. And you could just imagine, you know, she sells face to face, and this website, you know, this, this web page wasn't selling very well. And and so what she effectively gave us in that list of 22 things was like ready-made conversion copy, and and it's not something that you'd ever get from a book, and it's not marketing best practices or anything like that. But but that's you know, I'd say that's one of the main things you need to do whenever you're selling something is to find someone who can tell it face to face and learn everything they know about selling. It, a, a lot like in the early days of TV advertising with Alvin Eikoff. I don't know if you ever read yep. his biography. Yeah, where, where Alvin Eikoff, he, he pioneered um, TV advertising by, by finding people who were already selling products at, you know, at, at trade shows and things, and then effectively just pointing a camera at them and putting them onto TV because those people already had um, highly sophisticated sales pitches that were, you know, were had, had been eroded by customer objections in the same way that like a pebble on a beach is eroded by all the sand and polished up to the point where it was optimal. And so that's, that's the first step is learning to become a really good salesperson. Good. The, the, next, the next one that we find is really valuable and again, doesn't get mentioned in you know in in copywriting books is is to properly go and buy the product yourself and and to and to buy it with your own money and to buy it not in a kind of um, not with a marketer's hat on but actually as a customer you know shop around so he is he is me actually yeah a good little tip is I used ScreenFlow um, for this it, whenever whenever we order things we always use screen flow and video our own faces because it's useful when you watch the movie back to be able to actually see your emotions at different points and to see the point at where you're getting frustrated and mm-hmm. confused. So, yeah, order the product and order it from, not just from your own site or from you know, your client's site, whichever site you're working on, but also shopping around for it because obviously, obviously um, you need to know the competitor's site as well to be able to see what the customers really see. And as you can see there, in the corner, you can see I'm, I was actually using Skype at this point because I was actually 
I was actually making phone calls to find out questions from, about the, from the site as well, so speaking, speaking to customer support. So really properly ordering it, that's, that's the thing that we do next. And then, and then finally become a customer, actually use it. Here's, um, here's a shed. This is a, we, we, we've been working with a company that sells sheds online. And um, we, so we asked in the company who, you know, which of us was most in need of a shed. Mm. And, um, and there's my, my, my co-founder, Ben. Happy, he was the, I wouldn't say he needed a shed, but he was the person who was least reluctant to buy a shed. <laughs> <laughs> so so we, um, there's, there's Ben with his proud new, proudly with his new shed. But even then, because he actually, he didn't just, you know, pretend and use the website and, and get, got... He didn't just stop before the checkout. He went through the checkout, went through the order process, and and only in doing so do you really get all those emotions that a real prospect does in ordering. And even even here, he found one of the things he noticed was that the shed it couldn't he couldn't get it into his backyard because he had to go through the house and the the, the packs were too large to fit through. So they actually they they damaged the um, the skirting boards on on his house as he was getting into the house. So he reported back to the company and they redesigned all the sheds based on that feedback he gave. Nice. So, um, so there's a load of, you know, and, and obviously the effect that that will have on their lifetime customer value and the, like the net promoter score is, is huge. The fact that, you know, they genuinely fixed something that was a real issue there. So they're the, they're, they're the techniques. And fine, and, and the other one is here is to have People always say, you know, you should write as if you're writing to one person. But what we find is it's useful to it's useful to have in mind. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, only only you guys right. could have Seth Godin and Tom Selleck on the same team. I like that. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, you know, yeah, I'm so used to seeing this image, I forget how weird it looks to someone who hasn't seen it before. <laughs> I'll I tell you what this is, this image. When we started our company, we decided who the people were that effectively, if we were giving a talk, who the people were in our front row of our talk, who were the who were the people we're really writing to, and so so we each one of these people represents a different demographic that we want to keep in mind when we're writing our articles, and so one of them represents um, the marketing world, one of them represents the direct response world, one of them represents the um, the usability world. There's Jacob Nielsen up there. One of them represents um, our existing clients, and one of them represents our past clients. Um, yeah, clients around the past. All the people that we should keep in mind when we're writing articles, and that we find that really, really useful to have real people, not to not just be imagining what you know a, a, what someone would look like, but to actually have one person in mind for each type of you know a type of audience that you have for each, um, for each you know, type of person in the audience mm -hmm. and and also it we also have um yeah tom Selleck's face is is covering it, the one that i didn't really want to reveal but it's our it's our true target customer who we're really writing to it's a person that we know and all of our blog posts and all of our reports are written for one specific person who we want to um you know who's the ideal person we want to be reading and liking our stuff gotcha. so yeah that we find that really really useful to mm -hmm. be actually targeting um to be targeting to writing for one person so again you're not pretending you are actually writing as if as if you're writing a letter to one person great makes sense the next the next one that we find really useful is is because obviously in, when you're working on a page you reach the point where you do need you need to know what the person's objections are, what the what the real reader's objections are, and um, and so what we do is we use Kiss Insights. We use loads of different survey tools for gathering the objections of visitors. But I'd say the one that come we use loads is Kiss Insights. It's now it's actually now called Qualaroo, so it's Q U A L A R O O like kind of I guess a mix between kangaroo and quality. Right. I'm sure that. And not, what does that I'm do? Sure. I, I mean, what it does? Can you see the bottom right-hand corner? Yes. I'm just cringing because the owner of this company. I'm sure that wasn't what he had in mind when 
he came up with a name. I'll have to find out what it really means. Um, bottom right is, uh, can you see that little survey that pop, that's popped up there, the great sure. thing, saying, did you decide to download our PDFs? Please let us know why or why not. You can be brutally honest. We love feedback. That's on our own site, um, sign-up page for our email newsletter. Then that's a question that we ask. And, and what happens is every time we go through that data, we, get, we read through why people aren't signing up at the moment. Because if someone clicks no there, then a little, a little area pops up, um, a field where they can explain why not. And, and the, great, the really, really powerful thing is that every time someone gives a reason why, uh, why they're not signing up, we then change the page to fix that objection, to overcome that objection, and then the conversion rate increases. And we've got that constantly on there. And, and we're, yeah, this page just keeps improving as a result of, of just simply asking the users why they're not taking the action that we want them to. And so, then, so, Carl, then, let me interrupt to ask. So even, even with one suggestion, it is sufficient to make a change? It's, you know what it is? You, you'd think not, but with qualitative suggestions, so often someone will say something and you'll think, wow, how didn't we notice that? Mm. They, you know, they're right, it's crazy. You know, it might just be that someone says that there's a problem where, you know, when you tab between the different fields on the form, that, that you, you can't tab onto the button. You think, yeah, that's actually properly something that's broken. Or it might just be that something isn't well enough explained. Yep. Or, or so, so it's not that we res you'd respond to every single one, but it's surprising how often when someone says it, or, or it's also surprising how, how if you have like 10, e even only 10 feedback items, how often like half of them are saying the same thing. Gotcha. And the beauty is, and I don't think I'm going to go into any, any, any detail, I've kind of taken it for granted actually, but maybe I shouldn't have, is, is that you should be split testing, you know, anything that's even slightly controversial, then we do uh, split testing. It, it, does everyone know what split testing is these days, do you reckon, Fred? I, I would or think so. Only in my world, but everyone does. <clears throat> I would split think so. Testing. I think that the only concern would be that some people may not be getting sufficient traffic to, to have a split test be viable in the short run. Yes, absolutely. That's a, that's a very good point. And it's and it really a chicken and egg situation where you need to get yourself in a situation where you have got enough traffic to be able to spit test. It's so powerful being able to, like you say, when you make a change, you want to be able to carry out a split test using what I said. If, you know, the free tool is Google Analytics Content Experiment, which is now part of um, Google Analytics, or there are some, some great Actually, I'll direct. We've got a site called Which MVT. MVT stands for multivariate testing. So whichmvt.com, and that's a big comparison site um, of all of the different, not all of them, but all of the most um, popular split testing tools. So if someone hasn't got, if you haven't got um, split testing software set up already then if you go to whichmvt.com, then there's enough information there to help you to, to actually uh, choose which service will be best for you. Are you giving us a, a summary, though, and saying that you're still going with Google or recommending Google? Um, it, it, it does depend on what people want. Google, the Google Analytics Contact Experiments only, it doesn't do multivariate testing, and it's, um, it's free is the main advantage, and yep. it's built into Google Analytics. There are some... Services like Visual Website Optimizer and Optimizely um, have be they're they're better for usability. It's easier to test, set tests up, which um, it, it, you know it's it's often worth spending that bit extra to get a, for a service where there is, for example, phone support. You know, so when you know if you can't set something up easily, then you can just phone and ask for help. So, gotcha. so those tools have a have a, you know, play an important role. Um, Sounds good. What's next? And yes. So, so that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's the feedback. I'll not spend ages on this because, because it's written down, but it's, it's really worth when you're looking at a new site to, to think of all the different things 
the visitor's mental shopping list, all the different things the visitor must actually think before they before they place an order. So I'll just read out the bits in bold there. So they, they need to think that the site looks relevant. You know, when they arrive, they need to immediately think that the site's relevant. It needs to be obvious that they're in the right place. Um, they, they need to be, beyond that, they need to be confident that they shouldn't be considering the competitors. And, that, and also to remember that the competitors include doing nothing and ordering offline. So if you're selling, I don't know, if you're selling suits online, then just to remember that your biggest competitor is likely to be that the, that the visitor decides to order offline, or or if you're selling a I don't know a marketing course or something that's not a required something that's very much a discretionary purchase. That doing nothing is often your biggest competitor. Um, right. The next person has to think what you know they can easily find what they're looking for within your site. Then they need you need to make clear recommendations so they can understand which product types best. Then they then they need to um, actually decide which type of product they need, and also that this particular product is that is what they need. So you know, they so it might be that they've reached the point where they decide that they need a a RAID external hard drive, um, but then next they need to believe, be persuaded that your type of RAID external hard drive is the one that they should be buying. Um, sometimes, sometimes they you know. They, they fall down at the point where they you, they like everything they've seen, but they don't believe that the claims that you're making for the product, so you need to support them all with proof. Uh, sometimes they fall down at the stage of just having miscellaneous product-specific objections. So, um, uh, you know, the kind of thing that I mentioned before with a technology device where where they they might just have some very specific question that they don't that they aren't able to answer about the product which prevents them from going ahead and finally they they need to find the whole experience pleasurable because in so many businesses the real money is in the repeat purchases so so they need to you know I mentioned before about the shed company yep. not that it's shed a repeat purchase kind of business but but the fact that the whole experience is pleasurable is extremely important for the company's um, word of mouth reputation. So, so basically those, that mental shopping list is really useful when you ha to remind you of all the different stages, all, all the different stages at which a visitor can fall out of your funnel. You know, this is, this is all the things they need to think in their head in order to, in order to make a purchase. And, and so often we'll find that like one of these is the stumbling block. And until you fix that, then there's no point, you know, worrying about other stages sounds does good that, does that make sense Fred yeah, absolutely yeah. The, so yeah to, to finish the section on on the research don't start writing until you know everything about the product until you've bought and used the product with your own money until you can understand why people buy it until you could tell it to yourself if you could tell it to yourself or friends until you know all the objections and have great counter objections and that you've gathered proof to support all the claims. So don't even start writing until you can do all of those things, which is, which is, it might seem like a lot, but then at that stage the writing becomes really easy. Sounds the, good. So the te ste step two, and it's only a two step process, is writing it down. And yeah, weirdly, there aren't many people who excel at both stages. The people who are good at the earlier research stage, you know, often aren't good good at writing. And similarly, people who are good at writing often shirk away from the kind of, um, you know, the earlier stage of having to speak to salespeople and get stuck in with all the research. So, so it's worth it in this talk to think of which, where where your current weakness lies. Is it in the writing part or is it in the research part? The, Here's just a picture of a, a packet of ham that I bought a, a few months ago, um, and I just took a photo because the, that little comment on there, just a suggestion. In reality, when you when you're buying ham, you know when you when you're buying ham from a from a butcher's, you would just never get in a situation where you you know the butcher puts it into the bag and hands it to you, and just as you're walking away, the butcher says, uh, "Hang on a minute, just a suggestion." You say, yeah, oh, yeah. What's what's the suggestion? And he says, you could make a sandwich with that. 
And you say, yeah, is, is, is that all you were going to say? He said, yeah, that's all I was going to say. It's just a suggestion. You might want to um, put it in a sandwich. <laughs> it's like, sort of like, duh. Yeah, and it's it's like, you know, I, I don't... It is. It's strange how actually moving to the next slide. The act of writing turns many a genius into a moron. There's something strange about writing, which is that people write things down that they wouldn't dream of saying to someone face to face because it would just be a stupid thing to say. <laughs> and you see it all the time on websites. One one thing that we we sometimes do, just you know, if someone says, "How can I improve my homepage?" We say. Oh, well, let, or, or a landing page. We say to them, I know what, I'll walk out the door. <laughs> we, we've actually done this quite a lot. You walk out the door, and, 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 and I say, I'll, I'll, I'll knock on the door, and you, you, know, you tell me to come in, and I'll say, okay, I've been searching Google for you know, your type of product. Please tell me all I need to know. And then the client has to, has to read out the words of the website. <laughs> To, so, so, so basically, it's, you know, it's a, what, what happens is that when you actually get someone to read out the words of their landing page face to face, they just realize how it's absolutely not what they would say to someone face to face, to the point that they cringe that they're even having to read it out to you because it's so distant from what they'd actually say to a real human that, it's, that, that it embarrasses them. So, so that's, I think that's a really useful thing is to, is to look at your landing pages and think, if someone knocked on my door and walked through now, is it actually what I'd say to them, or is it, or, or is it not? Hmm. I like it. Yeah. It's, so yeah, write like a human. Write like you you'd speak. And if you're not sure what you say in real life, then a great thing is just to actually record what you say to someone as you, um, as you're speaking to them. I think it's it's a really powerful technique for copywriting. Is to record yourself selling effectively, saying what you'd say to a prospect and how you'd explain it, and then get it transcribed because it doesn't cost much at all to get things transcribed these days. And uh, and and that will make a, a huge difference to the flow and you know, how natural your copywriting is. Good idea. <laughs>